about to take it. When is it? Well, I, have, I see 632. Are we good to go? Let's go. All right. Well, let's talk about your praises and prayers, what you have first. I wanted to find out from Kay. She was having a doctor's appointment, what, last Thursday? Uh, well, she she got her shot in her eye on uh, Monday. Monday. That went well. Uh, okay. With the exception now they want to give her a shot in the left eye. Oh, oh my. Maybe help. It, that should help us stop <coughs> circles anyway. Okay. Um, no, they do want to give her a shot in the left eye because they're starting to see uh, a little bit of pressure in the left eye. All right. Uh, so well, her leg well, has gone down. Can't understand what might have caused that. Uh, uh -huh. There was no pain with the swelling, so that's gone right. down. All right. Well, we'll, we'll put it down for a prayer request there. I just wanted to find out what how she made out. So I guess okay. the one shot was good, but you got to get another one. Yes. <laughs> She'll go next Thursday and get her another mm -hmm. shot. So now Kay has two Cadillacs, right? Right. And that's, well, that's the other thing. She still has to, uh, we still have to figure out how she's going to get the cataract surgery done. Yeah. The doctor's they didn't, working they on didn't that. set a time, did they, Mike? Unfortunately, no, it's not, it's not the doctor. It's the insurance company we're fighting with. Oh, yeah, you did say. That's right. So, uh, her, the last time she spoke with her doctor, he felt confident that uh, that he knew a way you could get around it. That's all the further I can go. So, okay. Well, we'll keep that in our prayers too. That the insurance comes through for you guys. Thank you. Thank help you. out. Remember, Laura Beachley. Yeah. What? How? What happened this last week? I know I had a note here. She was in the hospital. So she, she's home, but that's all that I know. Okay. Well, better to be home, right? Right. Okay. And who else? Gabby? Was there surgery there? Yeah. Gab <laughs> Gabby had her surgery, and it went well, but she's in severe pain. Now, today uh, her dad said that uh, she's being more tolerant of the pain, and they hope within the next couple weeks she may be able to come home. Okay. And they, they feel that she may not need any surgery until the near future. Okay. More surgery, so. I guess, okay, and I don't know about Jack. He, he didn't join us tonight. Last time he was having a little bit of back problem, if you remember. I he said he had, had a disc issue. Yeah, I True. He gave him a shot. I talked to Jack yesterday, and he said he was uh, doing better. Okay. But he, he's still out of a little ways to go. Okay. And I talk to my sister uh, every day, and she is doing amazingly better. So thank you so much for her prayers. Um, she still will need that. But a part of her problem was uh, her vision. Uh, and so when she went to see her eye doctor, she was able to read the chart. And the doctor was amazed. And actually, she was amazed at herself. So it looks like it's in a range where she's going to be able to drive. That was her main, one of her main concerns. So anyway, things are looking up for my sister. I appreciate your prayers. I have a request. What's that, Butch? And also a praise, actually. Um, Frankie Carly, um, who was the first person who hired me for a job in 1972, also hired me for my last job in 2002. Um, he's been having some prostate cancer pro issues, and he went through the full thing of chemo, and, uh -huh. and his number, he just had his numbers tested like early this week, and everything is good. Oh, wonderful. I have a praise. <laughs> yeah, John. Tomorrow I'll have the privilege of having lived 89 years. Oh, oh we should probably, hey. we should probably, hey. we should probably hey. sing. I think. 
Get us started, Linda. We should sing for John. Happy birthday, Happy birthday to you. To you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. And many more. The <laughs> church family, you mean very, very much to me. Well, John, we're happy for you. That's great. I have a prayer concern then, yet. Okay, Eric. So dad was feeling a little woozy, so I was out mowing. I got most of the yard done. Uh huh. So I don't know if it's a good thing he's out mowing now or if I'm going to get yelled at tomorrow by mom. <laughs> uh. But he, he didn't feel comfortable getting up on the tractor. It was up too high. Okay. But apparently he's out there now, my wife confirmed. <laughs> All right. Well. Oh, uh, we just need to keep him in our prayers that he doesn't do something he shouldn't do, right? Yep. Any other praises or prayers y'all have? All right. Well, then let's uh, let's unite in prayer, and um, we'll do like we've done. Give you a little space. If any of you want to lead in prayer, that's fine. Uh, and then I'll close the time of prayer. I'll wrap it up then. So uh, let's just bow for prayer and if, feel free to pray as God may lead you, okay? Lord, I give thanks for, for Rick, who's been so diligent to help keep our church family together through the medium of Zoom. Thank you for his efforts. Thank you for our church family, Lord. Lord, we do give you thanks for your many blessings that you give us. It's a lovely, lovely day today. We just thank you for that. And that springtime, and from what we can see, it looks like warmer weather is a coming. Uh, so we just give you thanks, thank Father, you, for just the beauty we see around us and the promise that that all holds of your love and your care. For we know that, as Jesus said, you know, how you care for the sparrows, and we certainly, you value us much more highly than many, many sparrows. So. Thank you, Father, uh, for the evidence of your care, and we know that we can come to you with our prayers. We praise you uh, that Kay got the one eye taken care of, and we pray for the left eye. She's going to get a shot in that next Thursday, and we pray they will help with her vision and all. And for the ultimate, she's going to have the cataract surgery sometime future, uh, that the business with the insurance companies can get worked out so that when the time comes that the surgery can, can be done. We're also thankful Laura got home, just be with her and pray for her continued recovery and that Gabby's surgery went well, but we pray for release from the pain and that she too can come home uh, in, in, in short order. They're saying a few weeks, Lord, but with healing and strength that you can provide, maybe it can be even sooner. Uh, and we're glad to know Jack's doing better since he had his shot. And I thank you, my sister is doing so much better. Just continue to watch over both of them. Uh, and we pray, Father, oh, we want to praise you, too, for uh, um, Butch's uh, uh, old boss, for uh, Frankie, for uh, the, the treatments that he had. And it's, it looks like they've been very effective with the prostate cancer. And so we're just glad for that. And thank you for that. And thank you for wisdom given to the doctors. Uh, and uh, we pray for Rick's dad, for Bob, that you just watch over him and pray, Father, that, um, you know, I'm sure he wants to be doing something, but pray that you will have wisdom not to overdo it and uh, just be with Ruth that she'll not be over worried about any of that and just keep him in your care and keeping. And we praise you, Lord, for John's birthday tomorrow. Uh, just thank you for uh, how you've been so faithful and uh, to him and to Helen, to their family. And we just, uh, as friends, just celebrate that too and praise you uh, for, for that birthday. 
and for all your other blessings. For We thank you for our church family, that even in this time of separation, we can come together like tonight. We're thankful for Rick and how he does uh, pull us together. Thankful for Paula and uh, for Sue and Retta and for Linda as they help with uh, the worship team. And uh, Lord, and unseen ones, I know Hen comes around and does some cleaning around the church. And just thank you for Linda, who's faithful in the office to keep things coordinated and organized. Um, Lord, we just thank you for the team that we have. And uh, just pray, Father, that uh, as soon as it might be feasible and uh, wise, uh, that Lord, uh, this uh, stay-at-home order might be at least softened. We don't expect to go away right away, but that uh, the church can come back together, be with the council as they meet tomorrow night. And that's one of the things they want to talk about. So just guide that conversation and be with Jamin as he provides leadership there and everybody who's, who's a part of the team. And we are thankful too, Lord, for our people and for their giving. They've been supporting the church uh, really faithfully through this time. And that's just, that's good to know. So we just thank you for that too. Uh, and that the ministries can continue to go, uh, go forward. Lord, now we just uh, pray again for our time tonight. Uh, just bless our conversation and help us to uh, learn some things and uh, things that will help us understand what we believe and why we believe it. And then also that it can just impact us in our own Christian faith and practice. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, folks. Um, Linda, Linda sent out, um, with the announcement of this, uh, something to print out. Uh, yeah, I hope that. you printed it out that you can check that because it's a one-page yeah. summary. Um, we're going to look at the Statement of Faith from 1844. We're going to go back to that. And we're going to work our way down through it. That's, for what it's worth, there's what it looks like. But that was an earlier thing that was sent out. And we had worked our way down through, I think, number seven. Uh, so I want to pick up then with number eight. And we're basically going to probably run down through uh, number 12. Uh, tonight that basically it talks about regeneration and then it talks about the ordinances and so we'll be focusing mostly uh, on what we call the ordinances or, or our faith practice that we use to remember uh, Christ and what he's done for us but let's talk first about the um, number eight the necessity of regeneration or the new birth um, I think I had shared with you when we talked about Weinbrenner uh, how he grew up in a church family, of course, went to church, learned the catechism, knew all the right answers, but it wasn't until he was actually 20 years old and he was studying for the ministry that he came to realize that at some point he needed to make a personal uh, decision. In other words, he had to own it. I mean, it had, I don't know how to describe it, but he just, he had to uh, acknowledge Christ as his Lord and Savior. Um, it isn't that he didn't believe it, it's just that it never um, had that strong impact uh, in his life where he had made a decision, a public decision for Christ that he was going to give his life uh, to Christ. But that happened on Easter Sunday in 1817 when he was 20 years old, uh, when he gave his life and heart to Christ. And that really made a huge impact on him. During the time frame that he was growing up, it's what we know as the Second Great Awakening, it kind of starts in 1801 with the Cane Ridge Revival. You ought to look that up sometime on Google, and, and you'll learn a lot about how it was frontier revivalism, um, and it involved all, all church bodies. It wasn't just one church body, but whether you were Presbyterian or Methodist or Baptist or non-church or whatever, it was just all, all people. They came together, and, uh, and there was a revival where people's lives were... Uh, changed and there were healing miracles all sorts of things but that was the second great awakening and in that whole process it lasts all the way up to the civil war uh, it's kind of like the thing that would be uh, it would flare up and then it would die down and it would flare up again in another place and die down and whatever and so Weinbrenner would have grown up with that kind of preaching about the idea of you must be born again in fact it's often said that was his life verse John 3 7 where Jesus said, truly, truly, I tell you, you must be born again. Uh, and it's so, when he made his decision for Christ, it, it made such an impact on him that that became the central theme of really his preaching and his life, is helping people come or making that first time uh, step for Christ. Um, there's a lot we could say about the background to all of that, but we're just going to, I'm going to let it rest. You, in the Churches of God, I think that, he, in fact, he wrote a book 
where he put some sermons into a book. Uh, they were sermons and they published it then about the, uh, a practical treatise of, uh, on regeneration, about what it means to be born again. Is, is that a, a, str a different term? You're all familiar when I use that phrase, what I'm talking about, right? Right. From John chapter three, right? Where Jesus says you, ha you have to be born of the water and of the spirit meaning we all have a physical birth, but we need a spiritual birth too. And that is when we're born into God's family, when that time when um, each one of us comes to realize, I need Jesus in my life, and we invite him in uh, to be Lord of our life. Um, so to be born again then is to be born into the family of God. And uh, it was the revival services were characterized by a lot of emotion, um, but Weinbrenner would be the first to tell you that although emotion is important, it's not essential. The really essential thing is the faith in Christ, uh, in trusting in Jesus. So I don't know about your own, ex if your own personal experience with Jesus at what time. Um, I know Linda, she could tell you, I won't speak for her, but I think, what, how old were you, hon? Were you four years old or something like that? No, I was between five, five and six, because we had already moved out to Fayette Street. Okay, so you were at the new house then. Yeah. Yeah. So she was five and six. I, I, was, I know I was 11, uh, and my, mine was at uh, an old-fashioned tent revival. I don't know what other people, what your experiences might have been. It could happen at home. You could even be by yourself, or some. usually somebody's involved to share scripture. I remember Romans 10, 9 is being shared with me, but if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So that's the verse they used with me that I remember at the tent revival, and they put my name in there and said, if Ed confesses Jesus as Lord and Ed believes that God raised him from the dead, um, he'll be saved. So anyway, that, that's became a core teaching for Weinbrenner and carries over into us as the churches of God, growing out of the Second Great Awakening. It's very important for us. We could perhaps be called a pietistic type church in that regard, that it's, it's not just enough to, to know the right answers. It's very important that you also have the right answers in your heart. You know what I'm saying? That you've got uh, the Lord is a part of your everyday life. It's just not being a Sunday Christian or just being able to give the right answers to the catechism. And that's all well and good. I mean, it's helpful to know the right answers, but the issue is, is that it has to be that inward light or that inward relationship, uh, that inner self that is committed to Christ. Uh, so that becomes very critical for us as the churches of God. Um, I, I, I don't know, you must have had, uh, we often call them altar calls. You must have had times when people were invited to come forward in church and to pray a prayer of faith, uh, maybe a first time prayer or a rededication prayer or something like that if they want to walk closer to Christ. Um, you have, right? I can't imagine Pastor Mike didn't do that from time to time. I, see some, head, I see some heads nodding. I haven't done too much of that, except that if you'll notice in every sermon at the end, I always call for a personal action, and that is, is to deepen your faith in Jesus. Uh, if it's a first-time decision, or if it's a rededication, or just as a Christian, uh, it's very important for me to, in my daily life to draw close to Christ. Um, so that's why I say we would be considered pietistic in that sense, uh, is, is that it's, it's not just about the head and what we say. It's about what's in the heart and how we live, uh, that it becomes, it's, it's both. It's not either or, but it's both. Um, so for Weinbrenner, uh, he, he basically says that this becomes a very critical teaching. And as part of this, um, if you read through that item number eight, he says it's a change in man's moral nature after the image of God and the influence and power of the word and spirit through faith in Christ. Basically, what he's alluding to there is the process of sanctification. That is, is that we draw closer to Christ and live more for him day by day. doesn't mean we don't fall short or we don't fail sometimes, but the idea is that our goal is to be more like Jesus. Uh, so that that's a critical teaching. Any thoughts about that? 
Any questions? <coughs> All right, silent crowd. Um, <laughs> let's go. Let's go on to the next ones then. Nine, <laughs> ten, eleven, and twelve basically talk about what we know as the three ordinances. Uh, if you've got the other paper, it'd probably just be as easy to look at that. I call it a theological construct for three ordinances. Um, I'll just start at the top, but we better get a definition first. Um, if I use the word ordinance, uh, what are we talking about? What is uh, an ordinance, particularly from a church perspective, but really even in a um, governmental sense, there's a there's parallel. So what is an ordinance? Something you're ordered to do. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, if you look at the front part of the word, word the ordinance thing, it's in a sense ordained or it is required that you do it. I mean, we have ordinances in our communities, right? I mean, there's probably an ordinance against littering in your community. There's an ordinance for this or that. Uh, it's kind of like a law, if you will, or a requirement um, as an ordinance. There's another, we use that word, um, but some churches use a different word. They use the word sacrament. What does that word mean to you? Communion. Well, sure, communion would be one. Marriage. Uh, well, all right. Now, you're in the Catholic Church, I think there are seven or eight. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yes, marriage would be one. By God's grace. Sacrament would be a holy law. A law. Uh, I don't know. That sounds pretty echoey. You might have to say that again. <laughs> Uh, that uh, sacrament to me would be a, something that's a, a holy law or liturgical. Well, of course, sacrament, it has sacred at the beginning of it. Uh, and I think I heard Charlie say something about grace, didn't you, Charlie? Sacrament, yeah, God's grace. <laughs> yeah, a sacrament, when you think of it as a sacrament, it's a means of God's grace and generally a form of saving grace, uh, that it becomes part of what you need to do to stay in good relationship with God and as part of your salvation. Um, that could be argued either way, but sacrament is, is just generally seen in that way. And like I said, some churches observe more than them. In the, like in a Catholic church, you can't have them all because uh, holy orders is one, and in holy orders, you have to be celibate, uh, and marriage is one. So, you know, it makes it a little difficult to cover both bases there. Uh, certainly at the same time in life, it's difficult, but uh, I mean, there are people who are married and take holy orders. I mean, they become single and then they take holy orders in the Catholic Church. But the sacrament has the idea of conveying uh, grace uh, and especially saving grace um, in that regard. But we don't use that word because we don't view the ordinances at that level. We look at them uh, more as a remembrance of what Christ said we should do. So, that, oh, are we all going to have dinner, Barb? Yeah, dear. What's, what's for dinner, dear? <laughs> <laughs> well, let's wait till she lifts up the fork and we'll see. What's for dinner? <laughs> well, I either eat it now while it's warm or eat it later when it's cold. So, no, eat it now. <laughs> eat it now. We're eating cheese in cheese you because we're all jealous. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. So anyway, so from an ordinance, it's something that uh, if you look at the top of the paper, uh, that we would say uh, Jesus has given us a command that we should do it, and he also himself did it by personal example, okay? And for us, we view that there are three ordinances. Now, all churches that I know, all Christian churches, uh, affirm uh, at least two of the three, uh, and it's the third one we'll have to talk about a little more that we don't see everywhere. But the Lord's Supper or communion and baptism, I mean, I can't think of a single Christian church that doesn't practice both of those in one way or another. They may take, they may, it may do it differently or they may have different ideas about them. I mean, I mean, obviously for baptism, there's the baptism of children and then there's the baptism of adults and there's some who do it uh, once backwards. That's how we do it in, in water. Uh, so you're immersed or it can be done 
forward three times. A lot of Anabaptist church do that. Um, so there's any number of ways that it can happen. Um, <laughs> I won't talk about the Orthodox Church. It has some very unique ways for child baptism. Um, it, one, one way in the Orthodox Church is you bring the baby up, and the baby's wrapped in a blanket, and they're naked, and then the, the priest takes them by uh, their legs and immerses them in, a, in cold water uh -huh. and pulls them back up. So you can guess what kind of screaming baby you would have after that. Uh, but anyway, they're just different practices. But most Christian churches have some form, well, not most, all have some form of the Lord's Supper and baptism. But the third one, the washing of feet, uh, is, and we'll talk about that at a little more length here, but that's, those are the three that we observe because of Jesus' command and Jesus' example. And each one of them represents something about God's mission, something about redemptive history, and tell us about Jesus' role in redemptive history. So it becomes very important as a remembrance for us. Now, what, do you remember what church background I told you Weinberger came out of? German Reformed. I heard it. German Reformed church background. Okay. Now, in the German Reformed church background, uh, they would have practiced infant baptism. Okay. So that's what he would have been familiar with uh, growing up. They would not have practiced feet washing. And obviously, they also would have observed the Lord's Supper. But in the Reformed tradition, um, the view of the ordinances, or if they use the word sacrament, but the view of the Lord's Supper or baptism um, is different than say, the Lutheran view uh, or even some other church's view. Um, any ideas about what the German Reformed Church coming from Ulrich Zwingli, what the view of the ordinances, what, what it was, particularly baptism and the Lord's Supper? It, it was viewed as commemorative, as symbolic. You did it symbolically because Jesus had done it, and so you're following in the footsteps of Jesus symbolically. And also, as far as what you are remembering about redemptive history, uh, it is symbolic. In the Catholic Church, um, really, when they lift up the bread, and the, in the old days, the Latin was pronounced, hocus meus corpus, that it's called transubstantiation, when the element actually becomes the literal body and blood of Christ, okay? Uh, in, the, in, the, in Luther, it took a step away from that uh, in that his view was it was a spiritual uh, and yet uh, a, a mystical union with God uh, so that what you have is known, it's known as consubstantiation. That is, it is still bread and it still is a wine, but you are doing it with Christ. There is a spiritual, deep spiritual communion that occurs um, in the taking of the elements. Now, Zwingli did not see it as sacramental. And so his view was more of what I would call common grace uh, as opposed to saving grace, in that because Christ commanded it, you are being obedient to the command, and therefore you receive God's favor because out of obedience. Uh, so that the elements themselves are just representatives. They're symbolic. They are reminders of Christ's body and his blood or of his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, that they are reminders of what he has done for us. Uh, but they do not have in themselves, in of themselves, uh, a deeper spiritual uh, benefit or value. I mean, it's just water. It's just wine. It's just bread. Uh, so that's the Reformed background out of which Weinbrenner came, and he brings that over into the Churches of God. That's, that's where we come from in our view of the uh, services. That's why we take off with Paul says, do this in remembrance of me. They are services of remembrance for us. Uh, the Lord's Supper to remember, obviously, his passion, and baptism to remember what it means to be um, you know, buried in Christ and raised to new life in Christ, based on Paul, I think, Romans chapter 5. Um, but feet washing becomes something different. Uh, that was not practiced uh, by the Lutherans or by uh, the Reformed. Now, I don't know, they may do that now. Uh, a number of Christian churches have picked up uh, the, this, the um, service of washing of feet. In fact, um, on, I want to say, I guess it would be Monday, Thursday, uh, the Pope will, they, they usually find 10. Uh, 
people. The tradition was to go through Rome and find 10 indigent people that the Pope then would wash their feet uh, and symbolically represent <laughs> Christ. But it's not one of the, the uh, sacraments. Um, but they did do it as a commemorative service to remember Christ. And I do think there are other churches who have done that. But there was a group of Christians at the time of the Reformation that feet washing was a very vital part of their faith and practice. And that's in part because um, the Reformation, when you think about the word Reformation, what do you think of? Reform. Yeah, reform. That is, let's fix what's broken or what's wrong and let's, um, you know, make it right. So you wanted to reform the church. I mean, all of them really initially, like Luther and Zwingli and others, they did not want to leave the Catholic Church. They felt like they got pushed out in some ways um, when they were banned or excommunicated. Um, but anyway, they really were looking to reform and get the church to go back to uh, basically its early apostolic practice. That's what they wanted. In other words, because the, the scriptures now were available in common language, they wanted to follow the scriptures. But the idea was reform. Um, that was really not true for this other group. Any of you here of uh, Men of Simons? Yeah. Okay, he too was a Catholic priest, just like Zwingli, just like Luther, and whatever. But Men of Simons uh, in the Reformation period in the 1500s, his goal was not to try to reform. His goal was to separate and form a group that would restore the New Testament practice. So their goal, the Mennonites, did they become, because of Menno, Simon's Menno, become the Mennonites, the followers of Menno. Uh, they, be, they become, uh, they, they are the first of what we would call restoration movement. They want to restore biblical Christianity. And so they want to go back to the practice of the early church. Now, everybody kind of turned on them and persecuted them because for one thing, they abandoned infant baptism. The Lutherans and the Reforms uh, and all the Reformed tradition, uh, well, I should say most of the Reformed tradition, that changes when the Baptists come along. Um, but certainly with uh, Calvin and others um, into the Presbyterian Church, they, they affirm infant baptism, but not the Mennonites. They couldn't find it in the New Testament. And so basically they felt that you had, it was about a believer's baptism, that you had to come to Christ in faith, and when you did, then you were eligible for baptism. Um, so anyway, they did not do they did not do infant baptism. Uh, the other thing they did do in reading John 13, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, they felt that what Jesus said, "If I, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet." And so they embraced that as a teaching of Jesus that they needed to follow it as a command. Just like he said, this is my body broken for you as often as you do this, do in remembrance of me. Or in the command that we are to go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So just like Jesus commanded uh, the Lord's Supper and baptism, they felt he commanded feet washing too. Uh, so anyway, the Anabaptist groups, with starting with the Mennonites, but if I use terms like Dunkard or the Brethren Church or whatever, you would know who I'm talking about. Or how about Messiah College? Uh, that's the Brethren in Christ, the old river brethren. Um, you know, they would, walk, they would wash feet. They come out of the Anabaptist tradition, okay, or teaching. <clears throat> Weinbrenner, in, in Pennsylvania, you, you can't escape the Anabaptists. They're here, right? They migrated here because of persecution and whatever in the early 1700s, settled here. And so to Weinbrenner comes along 100 plus years later, the Anabaptists are well established, and and many of them are very much about pietistic faith. That is, you gotta. It's not just what's in your head, uh, whether it's the Augsburg Confession if you're Catholic. I mean Lutheran or um, the Heidelberg Catechism if you're a German Reform. They wouldn't go on there at all. Um, basically, their idea was is that you needed that intimate, close relationship with Christ. It was an inner witness, an inner spirit, which, by the way, is how they connected with the Quakers and ended up coming to Pennsylvania or invited to Pennsylvania because their basic theological belief in the inner witness of the inner spirit was very akin to the Quaker view of the inner light. Uh, and so that's why William Penn went and invited them to come to Pennsylvania and how so many of them ended up here. We don't realize it, but a lot of them went east 
into Hungary and ultimately into Russia as well. But many of them came here to Pennsylvania. So when Weinbrenner grew up, he would have met some of these people, but ultimately when he took his ministry in Harrisburg, he, he met up with the Anabaptists. And uh, Bishop Erb was one of them who had a great influence on him. And that's when he was invited to participate in a feet washing service. And I think I might've told you this, that uh, the first year they did that, Weinbrenner said uh, that they should not bind on his conscience what they held binding on, on uh, theirs. In other words, he, he had not yet come to the place of embracing feet washing as an ordinance. Certainly the Lord's Supper and baptism, that was never a question. And by that time, he had moved from infant baptism to adult believer baptism. We're talking in the later 1820s. Um, so anyway, but the next year came around and Weinbrenner did a study of, um, of John 13. And when he came back the next year, he did participate because he had embraced feet washing um, as equal to the Lord's Supper and to baptism based on the fact that Jesus made a clear command and that Jesus himself practiced it. And Jesus told us we should do it too. If you wash one another's feet, I've washed your feet. If, I, if you wash, you should wash your feet, each other's feet. Um, so Weinbrenner embraced it. So when the Church of God got going, those were the three ordinances uh, that became part of the churches of God. Uh, Lord's Supper, baptism, and then of course the addition of feet washing that grew out of that Anabaptist or that pietistic tradition. Um, and so that, that became those three. Um, now, Weinbrenner through his life, he wrote on these subjects. And so I don't think what we have as a developed understanding I don't think he was there from the start. I think it grew over time as he studied the scriptures and came to realize how important these three ordinances were. So I wanna look at the sheet um, that you have there uh, about the three ordinances that we practice. And let's just walk through some of those and I'll highlight some of them a little more. I did talk up there about the sacrament and uh, the issue of consubstantiation and the symbolic view. Our view of the ordinances is it's a common grace the blessing comes in obedience by doing it since Jesus commanded it, but it's not about saving grace because our salvation rests in Christ's sacrifice on the cross. But as you look at down on the left hand, uh, the first column under the ordinances, um, these are the details of the ordinance, and then we'll look at each one. I have feet washing first, Lord's Supper, and baptism. And there's a, there's a reason for that. Um, uh, maybe I should jump down here. Uh, it would just be easier, I think. Uh, jump down to the, what, the line that says Christology. What do the ordinances teach us about Jesus? Christology is just a fancy name for, you know, the science of studying Jesus or the Christ. Um, what do each of these represent? It's probably easiest to start with the Lord's Supper. Um, the Christology of the Lord's Supper is clearly the crucifixion, right? And his suffering death on the cross. I mean, that's what he says, my body, my blood, okay? What happened? If you look at baptism, it has to do with his resurrection and ultimately his ascension to heaven or his glorification, okay? So the Lord's Supper is about his atonement. Uh, the baptism is about his glorification. And, we, and the other thing, practical application there, we can identify with each of those. But feet washing represents his incarnation. This comes from um, Philippians chapter 2, uh, where it talks about how Jesus became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. If you look at Philippians chapter 2, it's known as the kenosis passage, the emptying path passage. Uh, so he emptied himself. He did not think uh, being equal with God was something to hold on to, but he was willing to humble himself and be made in the fashion of a man and so he came to earth. Feet washing for us represents Jesus' uh, incarnation. That is his physical reality that he was God who became man. He is the God man. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you should wash uh, one another's feet. Um, anyway, that's why it appears first, because the incarnation occurs with Jesus' birth and coming to earth, um, where you have the God man uh, who now is the Savior, the Messiah. He gives his life, that's the uh, crucifixion, the passion, and then ultimately he's raised to new life and an affirmation of his salvation uh, that he brings and offers. He's a confirmation by God that the salvation is complete. And so it, that's the one, two, three. 
So we're talking about feet washing being the incarnation and the uh, Lord's Supper as being his passion and the baptism as being his um, resurrection. So the three great acts of Christ, the incarnation, uh, the sacrifice, and then the resurrection uh, that's there and what happens. So there's other ideas that are involved in this. Um, this incarnation is really developed in John's gospel. In John chapter 1, I'm still under the Christology, and just go down a line or two to the bottom. You know the passage from John 1.14 um, about the Word, right? The Word was in the beginning. The Word was with God. The Word was God. There wasn't anything made that was made that he wasn't part of. It talks all about Jesus as being one with God and as the Word of God. And then how he became flesh in 14, I think. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth in John 1, 14. Um, so the idea of the incarnation is really big in John's gospel. And that's one reason why I think the feet washing story is recorded in John's gospel. You don't find it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, it's not mentioned there. In fact, it's only mentioned later in one of Paul's letters, sort of in passing. Um, but the feet washing was just an everyday practice. Uh, you know, you went to a house, you know, feet washing, whatever. But Jesus gives it a new interpretive meaning in John 13 on that last night of, his, of the Lord's Supper. Uh, and it is a revelation of the fact that he is the eternal word. And for John's gospel, that becomes a very important truth. And so that's why I believe it's in John's gospel. And some people will say, okay, that's the only place it appears, so... We can't make a big deal out of it. It's not that important. Uh, and yet it has all the qualities of the other ordinances. Jesus did it. Jesus commanded it. Uh, and uh, Jesus told us that we are uh, supposed to follow his example and do this in remembrance of him. Um, so anyway, um, you can argue that around. I, one of my points I will make is like the, uh, okay, so if we're only going to, if something is only in one gospel, then it's not as important. Uh, as something that's in other Gospels. all I mean, like the feeding of the 5,000 is in all four, so that's got to be really important, right? Yeah. But, the, uh, but the Good Samaritan story, that's only in Luke's Gospel, so that's not quite as important, right, <laughs> as a teaching of Jesus. Uh, it's really silly to think of it that way. Uh, all teachings of Jesus are important. Some are shown to be more, they are revealed to us more in more than one place. But that doesn't make, because something only occurs once, doesn't make of less importance. Um, anyway, uh, I picked out the crucifixion story from Mark, but we could pick any one of the four Gospels. Same, the resurrection and ascension, we could also pick any one of the Gospels. But I picked the Roman passage there, Romans 6 it is, where Paul talks about the meaning of the baptism that we have is to be uh, buried with Christ and raised to new life. So each one of the ordinances has its, um, how do you want to say, um, symbolism about what Jesus has done for us, be it his coming to earth, be it his dying for us, being his being raised uh, with the promise of new life for us. So if you go back up to the top then, Jesus' example, what we learn about Jesus here, uh, the feet washing is he came as a servant. I am among you as one who serves. Uh, John 13 is certainly the central passage. The Lord's Supper is a representation of his sacrifice. So I just like the alliteration, uh, servant, sacrifice, and savior. Uh, and so that the baptism confirms the fact that he is the anointed one of God and the savior. Uh, Jesus commanded, and that's there. Uh, and that command to wash feet is all tied up in the command to love one another. That's right there in that same passage later on in 13. All will know you are my disciples by the love you show to each other. That's verse 34 in chapter 13. So that has to deal with the, the trinity of uh, faith, hope, and charity. How's that song go? Um, but anyway, uh, so you have the representation of love, and then to remember, when Jesus said, remember me, that has our faith in Christ is centered. Um, I have scriptures there you can check. Uh, also, the ordinances all have some kind of physical element. I see somebody waving, hello, honey. Waving to Grandpa. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's dessert, right? <laughs> All right. Anyway, so each one of them has a, a tangible or physical elements that are involved, and they're listed there for you. 
Um, dropping down the theology, if we're going to talk about each one of these, uh, we learn about uh, the feet washing thing has to do with our sanctification. Remember Jesus said, if I wash you, you have, if I don't wash you, you don't have any part with me. So that there's this whole idea of his cleansing is necessary in our life um, and what he does for us as he washes us, not just the idea of feet washing. So there is a symbolic meaning in each of these, and the symbolic one for the feet washing is basically how Jesus cleanses us. And the Lord's Supper, it's justification, and all these theological terms, I'm not going to go into them. Um, and what does this mean for us at the very bottom? Uh, the efficacy. What does this mean for us? It's a new life in Christ. Basically, when Jesus, a lot of people will take feet washing only at this level. Uh, and this is a good level, very important level. And that's the level of service and humility. Um, that is, is that if I'm among you as one who serves, then you too need to serve. So that's part of a reminder to us that we're not greater than the master. And we are called in to, to serve one another and love one another. And then the Lord's Supper, that has to do with the faith that we have in Christ, our salvation and our redemption. Scripture verses there, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave me himself for me, Galatians 2.20. And then the last one, the resurrection, is our hope. And I didn't put it on here, but 1 Corinthians 15 would be a good one too. Uh, that in Christ, our hope is not just for now, it's forever. Uh, and so that's a very critical thing for us to remember each of these ordinances. Now, feet washing the Lord's Supper, we usually do together. You do at Bowman's Day, only do feet washing uh, at Maundy Thursday, right? Yeah. That was my experience, anyway, yeah. or expected experience. We didn't yes. quite get there. Have you done it at any other time? No. Nope. Nope. Well, Ryan, Weinbrenner thought you should always do the two together, feet washing and uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, because they all happened on the same night, uh, the Passover night when Jesus was betrayed. Um, I, I really think all the ordinances are as often as you do it. What has been your practice at Bowmansdale? Have you always done First Sunday communion? No. Not always. Just in the last not, year. Not always. What did you do before? Yeah, did you it do was... Once a quarter? Uh, yeah, once a quarter. Four times a year, right? It's like once a quarter and then Easter, well, Monday, Thursday. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, and then the fir and Christmas. first in July, first in October. And Christmas first Eve. First in the new year. Yeah. yeah. That, was, that was the general practice in the churches of God. Now, first of all, it really doesn't matter how often you do it. Uh, I actually think it's nicer to do it more often than not. But the quarterly communion idea, that again came from Ulrich Zwingli. Now, Luther thought that it should be done every week, just like the Catholic Church did, okay? But the problem that Ulrich Zwingli thought is, is that people did it so often, they forgot how important it is, and it got all messed up by the priest. All right, if I said to you, hocus pocus, what would you think of? Dominocus. Magic. <laughs> A movie. Hocus, hocus. <laughs> Would you think of some kind of magic or something? Magic, yeah. Okay, all right. Magic. Linda's smiling because she knows this is one of my favorite little things to bring up historically. It's a song. Well, maybe Mike had shared this with you, but I'll remind you uh, if you're not thinking of the direct. But it actually came from the Mass uh, when the priest would hold up the bread, and he is supposed to say in Latin, hoc es mass corpus, this is my body. That's what he's supposed to say. But by Luther's time, it got so messed up, and most priests did not know Latin, uh, that they were just holding it up and they were saying, hocus pocus. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's when the bread was supposed to be transubstantiated from bread to the literal body of Christ. Okay. And so that's where that phrase came from, hocus pocus. It's just a lot of hocus pocus. No. In the Reformation, they rejected that. Okay, Luther, Luther still held on to the idea there's a spiritual presence, okay? but it's always bread. It doesn't change its substance. Okay, and but Zwingli felt that you know it's representational, and we got to be careful 
because if we give it a sacred meaning, what happens is people will think it's hocus pocus, and particularly if we do it all the time. So his recommendation was we should only do it quarterly, just as a remembrance for people so they do not uh, get locked into the idea that their salvation is in that magic bread, okay? Their salvation does not rest in the magic bread, but in the sacred person of Jesus Christ, okay? So that's why Zwingli recommended quarterly communion. And that's why Weinbrenner in the Churches of God, why we practiced quarterly communion. Growing up, Linda and I in the Church of Chippensburg, we always did what Paula said. You know, it was the first Sunday in uh, January, July, and October, except for Maundy Thursday. We always did the spring quarter at the time of Maundy Thursday. And we always, uh, one, always had feet washing with the Lord's Supper. And the other thing was, it was always in the evening. Yes. Now, we, we will get to where Weinberger says it should be done in the evening. Uh, I guess I would ask you, is any of that important? Is it important whether you do it in the morning or the evening? No. no. I don't think so. I mean, obviously, Maundy Thursday is much more commemorative in the sense because it's that night when Jesus was betrayed. And so we bring it all together. But it's not about when or how. It's about the spiritual meaning that is involved in the remembrance of what we do. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, yes. Yeah, that's what, and so for Zwingli and Weinbrenner and for us, um, it's not how often we do it, but that we keep it meaningful uh, in, this, in our spiritual lives. So we do it on the first of each, uh, each month, um, and that's fine. Uh, we've been doing it every week now because we've been separated, and so I felt that this was a good way that we could keep our bond in Christ, in Jesus, is just to be remembering him that he's the one we serve and worship, uh, and, and just keeping that in front of us. So we've been doing it weekly. And I hope it doesn't become routine for you. I hope it has meaning uh, when we do that. Uh, not just the meaning, well, yes, the meaning of Jesus, but the meaning of us doing it together. This bread that we bless, is it not the body of Christ? In other words, we are one in Christ from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Um, so anyway, so feet washing has all, was at one point in the Church of God history tied to the Lord's Supper on a quarterly basis. Now we're only doing it on Maundy Thursday. I don't think that it matters that much. I mean, in that sense, we could do it every time, uh, even if we did it every week. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of things about logistics and stuff like that, so we just don't. The point is, as often as you do it, what did Jesus say about the Lord's Supper? I think yeah, it applies to feet to washing me. and the other. Remember. remember me, as often as you do it. So there's no requirement in how often, just as often as you do it, keep the spiritual meaning in it. In fact, 1 Corinthians 11 is very much about that because the Corinthian church kind of lost track of that. And they were treating it as a church dinner or church supper. Uh, and it just was not good. It's not a good thing. Which, by the way, is probably why we do not do love feast. Any of you know back, brethren background? Yeah, I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Love, feast, love feast is a very much part of the Lord's Supper, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is to commemorate when Jesus got together with his people. There's another sweetheart. Barb, you are blessed. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, so many of the, uh, the Mennonite churches will come together and Usually, it's a very simple meal. It's usually bread and a very brothy soup. Uh, you know, it's not like what we think of a potluck dinner or anything like that. Uh, That's a different but way. they do the agape feast, the love feast, to remember the night Jesus was betrayed. We don't do that. Um, but I have in my ministry at times, we, we have done that, where we did that. And then we went in at Monday Thursday, where we had a love feast. And then we went into the observance of the elements. Uh, maybe sometime we could do that. If you'd be open to that, it can be a very meaningful time uh, as you meditate and you remember what Jesus uh, did that night. Or you, I know you've done a Seder service, right? Yes. I think that's a really good way to do it. You can't do it all the time, but from time to time, because you can teach our children the meaning of the Lord's Supper, put it in its proper setting, which is the Jewish Passover meal. Um, so I'm all for different ways of celebrating it so we don't lose the meaning. I want it to have a spiritual impact on our lives. Now, here's the question. We, we, we're only doing feet washing now once, but we have done it with the Lord's Supper in the past. Uh, and we do the Lord's Supper any number of times. What's, why, why don't we get baptized more often than once? 
Why is that only a one-time thing? You know, you're, you're to affirm that your faith once, once, and then on that you're you're saved. But now baptism doesn't save us, right? Well, no, it doesn't save us, but it's an affirmation of yeah. your faith in Christ. Yeah. It's your declaration that I am now living my life for Christ, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like you'd have a medal to put on your chest. So to speak, yeah. Now, we don't, in our culture, now you do your baptism right out in the creek, right? Yes. That's actually very good. I think that's the right way to do it. I'm not opposed to a baptistry in the church, uh, you know, because like I said, it's not about location. It's about the condition of the heart. But really, I think out in the open air where people can see and you're making a public declaration, I think that's a very important thing. So I think that's a beautiful way to do it. Um, it's really interesting when Mike's been, we've done it the last couple of times. There's been a lot of actors and, and people in tubes and stuff, and they've actually stopped. <laughs> watch the baptism, you know, and then continued on their way. Well, I know this last time I was there when you did it. Uh, I came when Mike's last baptismal service is past sun is last Sunday in August there. Anyway, I remember people floating by in their kayaks and uh, just, just a very interesting experience. Uh, but to be there for the baptism, I just, uh, that just was very, very beautiful. But like you were, like what you're saying, uh, it is a, a one-time declaration of your uh, in your faith in Christ. Linda and I, well, I had the privilege, but uh, we've known, Linda and I have known people from the, uh, from Bangladesh particularly, but also in India. In those countries, when somebody is baptized, that is a public declaration that they are a Christian. And if they would come from a Muslim family, you know what that means for those people? They'll be executed. They, yes, their family, they are as if they are dead. And uh, depending how, Muslims have various striations too. You have liberal, conservative, and radical. Uh, depending how radicalized the family is, they would be pledged to kill that person uh, if they abandoned Islam uh, and became a Christian. So to become a Christian in a country like uh, India or Bangladesh, Bangladesh particularly, which is Muslim, uh, but even in India, because Hindus would have the same attitude. Although Hindus are a little different, they can kind of uh, absorb other faiths. You, you can be a Hindu and a Christian at the same time. In other words, when you have many gods, it doesn't hurt to add one more. You know, you, it's okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so from a very liberal Hindu, no, that, would be okay. it wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a problem. On all basis. You, know, you, you can practice a couple different kinds of faith if you want to. Now, if it's a radical Hindu, that's a little bit of you, know, you pick the right. You pick them all. That dead. way, hopefully, you have the right one. <laughs> yeah, I guess. I guess. But anyway, um, so it's a real mark of being a Christian in those countries uh, when baptism. And in fact, through the history of the church, uh, at different times, it has had that uh, that very declaration. So, like Coach said, that's why it's one time. And the idea being, of course, that uh, you know we we will be buried with Christ and we're raised now. That's a once decision uh, that we have made to serve the Lord. Uh, but feet washing, if it's about service, is a constant pledge. And the Lord's Supper, if it's a reminder of our salvation and uh, what Christ has done for us, that's something we need to constantly be remembering so we don't forget what Christ has done for us. So how about any thoughts or questions you have about uh, any of the ordinances? Yeah, I had in the uh, Brethren Church, the, uh, the Church of the Brethren, when they have that love feast, they call it a triune okay. love feast, yeah. a threefold love feast. Mm -hmm. so used, having been raised in that. It's really a good practice. Yeah, we, I did that once in Mechanicsburg, did the, did the love feast. And it was well received. It can be very I remember We did that sometime. I think I was at Plainfield when we did that. Yeah. We sat. In fact, um, depending how the church is constructed, uh, Charlie, you can do that all in the one. If they have, in, uh, trying to think where that was, that might have been down toward Waynesboro. I didn't, we didn't have a service there, but it was set up so that it could be made into a table or it could be separated so that then um, you could do feet washing as well, all in the same area. 
uh, that it was done. Sounds so like they, the tab sounds like the tables we have out at the pavilion. <laughs> the table that could be the table or a pew. Yeah, where it could flip over. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions that you might have or thoughts you might have? Well, bring them next week or email me or something if there's any that come to mind. Uh, there's a lot of stuff at the bottom of the page I didn't bother going into down there, like the practice in the ancient church and all that. But all three ordinances that we practice have been done um, really from in the church uh, since the beginning. Feet washing, uh, that one will vary, but obviously baptism and the Lord's Supper has been everywhere all the time. Feet washing, it's in various groups at different times. I think for next week, as we look at the uh, statement of faith, We'll pick up with uh, the 13th, uh, number 13, uh, if we believe in the institution of the Lord's Day or Christian Sabbath as a day of rest. Uh, that in, in my time since growing up, the Sunday attitude has changed a lot. Uh, <laughs> but we'll, we'll talk about that, and we'll move down through several of the others here. I'll have to see if I have any background uh, information to give you uh, to go with, but I'll, I'll check, and if... When Linda sends out, if I have anything to send along, it'll be attached uh, to the announcement for our Wednesday night. Again, any thoughts? <laughs> Watch Jeopardy. An interesting thing a week ago or so, the final Jeopardy question was, name the first six words in the first chapter of John. And all three of them got it right. Is that right? In the, in beginning, the beginning was the, the word. word. All three contestants <laughs> knew it. That was pretty good. Yeah, that is pretty good. <laughs> you were saying about how the one ordinance isn't listed in the other two or three Gospels. Well, I remember watching a show, and it was a, a forensic investigator, and he said if all three books were written the exact same way, he wouldn't believe it. But because each person picked what they thought was important, he believed all of it. Yeah, it's more likely you have an eyewitness account when they are all have a little different perspective. Right. When we exactly. were when we were still doing Sunday school, you know, remember that that was part of the uh, you know one of the tapes we watched. I remember he talked about that. Other comments or thoughts? We're going to wrap up, folks. Ed, you were talking about um, you were saying about for for next time, like the for Sundays, okay? How Sundays were were set aside and meant to be holy. Oh, yeah. Yes. And I remember one of the things I remember distinctly as a kid was um, we got unexpected company on a Sunday and it was in the winter time. Okay. And they, so they were going to stay for supper and they, we decided to make ice cream okay so we went i went with my father we drove down to this place where there was a milk machine okay where you could put like 50 cents in and you got like a half a gallon of milk and a uh -huh. or whatever okay and we and and i remember um like my dad it was like very hesitant to do this and we pulled off the road there with this machine and he was looking around to make sure there wasn't anybody to see him <laughs> milk on a sunday yeah. <laughs> now and so you know we've come a long way from there yeah. we certainly we certainly have we'll talk about that next time maybe i should ask you bring your favorite sunday sunday story from years back <laughs> I have probably a couple more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's close in prayer, all right? Father God, we give you thanks for time to be together, to share and to talk, and to look at the scriptures a bit. And we just pray, Father, that uh, we'll keep in mind about the ordinances, that they're really about Jesus and what he has done for us. His coming here and uh, serving us, that we might learn to serve others and his giving of his life blood for us on the cross that we might also give of ourselves uh, for others and whatever sacrifice you might ask that we would step up and 
we would be willing, even as he was willing. And then when we think about his baptism, that we will walk in newness of life. Lord, we just give you thanks for time to be together, to just see each other, laugh together, talk together, and be together. We give you thanks, and we look forward to uh, doing this again. And we just pray, Father, your blessings on us all for the glory of Jesus. And together we say, Amen. Good to see everyone. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Wow. Yeah. Here, Kenzie, say bye to Pappy. Hi, Jack. Hi. See you, Hi, Charlie. Hi, Linda. Hi. 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 Hi, Sue. Oh. Hi, Steve. Hi, Bob. Hi, Tracy. 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 Oh, we could do car oh, the end of the wall. Oh, I'm going to see my granddaughter. <laughs> I'm trying. Oh, nice. Hi. Here, say bye to my little partial barb. Oh, there she is. Hi. I'm sorry. She's a princess right now. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the royalty, you know? Yes.